since the summer, we've lost 25,000 unvaccinated Texans to COVID. They've basically thrown their lives away for what? For nothing. And, um, and so trying to uncouple the anti-science from the politics has been one of the toughest things I've ever had to do. Welcome to the Lone Star Play Podcast. I'm your host, Patrick Scott Armstrong. Join me and a famous guest. We discuss their career, life, food, Texas, and everything in between. Let's get started. The Lone Star Play Podcast is produced by TexasRealFood.com. Find out more at the end of this episode. Hi, guys, and welcome to the Lone Star Play Podcast. I'm your host, Patrick Scott Armstrong. We have a wonderful episode today. Our guests are... Dr. Peter Hotez and Dr. Elena Botazzi. They are both doctors here out of Texas, scientists, uh, who have developed a vaccine called Corbivax. Um, it's now being used across the world to vaccinate what they are calling the low income countries. So right now it's being used in India, it's South America, um, you know, people have been forgotten about. OK, it's the only way we're going to get through this is by vaccinating the majority of the world. Right. So um, they are just got nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize by Congress, Texas Congresswoman named Lizzie Fletcher. And it's absolutely wonderful what they're doing. So they took time out of their day to come talk to us about their new vaccine, how it's changing the world. OK, they will go down in history, y'all. Literally, they will go down in the history books um, for life saving vaccine they've created. So absolutely wonderful they've developed so they go into that and also we did a nice q a on some covid19 vaccine myth disinformation and misinformation so they did a q a so i did a panel y'all where i invited a few of my friends on a zoom and i talked to them about uh the vaccine they two of them had not been vaccinated and one had been vaccinated but regretted it so we talked and i took some of those concerns and asked uh dr uh, Peter and Dr. Elena, and they both, uh, you know, answered some of the questions. I, I wasn't able to get to all of them, um, you know, didn't want to take up, didn't have too much of their time. So and there was a lot to talk about, uh, but I was able to ask, you know, quite a few questions. So it's a great podcast, y'all. Sit back, relax, and um, yeah, enjoy this podcast with Dr. Peter Hotez and Dr. Elena Botazzi on their new vaccine, Corbivax. Quick word from our sponsor, Texas Real Food, and then we'll get started with this uh, episode. Be right back. Hi, I'm here to tell you about TexasRealFood.com. It's a great website where you can find local farm fresh food in Texas. Just enter your zip code, okay? It'll bring up Texas farms and ranches, farmers markets, farm to table restaurants, and more that are around you. It's really easy to use. Also, if you think there's a business that should be on the list that isn't on there, let us know. We'll get them added. As well as being able to enter your zip code and find all the great places around you, we also have great recipes, cooking techniques. You can learn about food and Texas food specifically um, and local food events that are happening in Texas. So it's a great website aside from that. And it also features, of course, the Lone Star Plate podcast that it produces. Um, we've also got some other features as well, like Food for Thought, Fresh from the Kitchen, Tasting Texas, the Texas Mom Blog, Real Food, Promptuary, a lot of great resources about Texas, all things Texas, focusing on Texas farmers and ranches and, you know, real food, y'all. Okay, so anyway, please go to TexasRealFood.com right now and begin your Texas journey for great food. All right, back to the show. Before we get back to our main interview, here is a 30 second snippet of a YouTube exclusive highlighting local Texas movers and shakers. Here is the owner of Mamo's Garlic Sauce out of Austin, Texas. Check out the full interview on our YouTube channel, Lone Star Play. We'll put a link in the description. Enjoy. Well, and that actually is fun for me as well, doing the markets and stuff again and the, the few stores we're in right now. I have people or call me or email me and say, oh my God, is this the sauce from the 90s? Are you really back? I had one girl come to the, park oh, that's awesome. the farmer's market and she started crying. Oh, like, my, oh my God, goodness. my mother has been trying to make the sauce for 20 years and she couldn't. I'm calling her right now and she was crying happy tears. 
All right, thanks for sticking with us. If you're not following us on social media, please go to Instagram or Facebook or TikTok and search The Lone Star Plate. Follow us to stay up to date for our exclusive content we put on social media. All right. And if you're on YouTube, hit the subscribe button and most importantly, the notification bell to be notified of all the new videos we put out. We've got exclusive content on YouTube. We break down each episode into clips. It's a wonderful way to uh, just stay in the loop with the Lone Star Plate. All right, without further ado, let's jump into this episode. Again, Dr. Peter Hotez, Dr. Elena Botazzi, uh, out of Houston, Texas, creating the Corbivax vaccine that is, as everyone is saying, game changing. And again, nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize, y'all. Absolutely incredible that we got him on the podcast. So my pleasure. Y'all enjoy. This is a big one, y'all. All right. Enjoy. Go on. Get with it. I'm, I'm Dr. Peter Hotez. I'm a professor of pediatrics and molecular virology at Baylor College of Medicine, where I also co-direct the Texas Children's Hospital Center for Vaccine Development with my science co-partner for the last 20 years, Dr. Mary Elena Batazzi. And we've been in Texas now for 10 of those years, 11 of those years now, and and have been developing new vaccines for parasitic infections for the poor and now coronavirus vaccines as well. Wow, absolutely wonderful. Look at that. And she joins us right at that perfect time, doctor. Look at that. <laughs> you came you? right at the perfect time. I'm glad. <laughs> How are you wonderful. doing? Great, wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us, doctor. Pleasure You're to have you. You're welcome. We literally just got we're just jumping in you ju again perfect timing look at that uh well dr peter hotez was just introducing himself uh so i'll have you just do the same and then this is very relaxed it's not live we edit it so we're just gonna kind of flow in i've got prepared some questions we'll make it uh very easy here sounds good so i'm maria elena botazzi and i am a professor in pediatrics and molecular virology and microbiology at baylor college of medicine also wear the hat of being associate dean of the National School of Tropical Medicine, and of course, also with Peter, co-directors of uh, Texas Children's Hospital Center for Vaccine Development. Wow, what titles y'all have are, are amazing, Too many. to be honest with you. Is, it, is it hard to remember all that? Like, <laughs> probably not. I, I don't think know. the titles are easy to remember. The work yeah. is that we have to make sure we have a hundred buckets so we can remember how, what to well, do. Well, it, it, it makes it makes for a very colorful lab coat, as you can see. It's yeah, absolutely. The, of course. Uh, the, I, coat of, the, the coat of many colors here. So. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just like, well, I'm a podcast host. It's, uh, it's like it's just real simple. That's it. That's all. That's all I got. That's all I got, guys. Uh, well, listen, we're going to do this in two parts. I won't take up too much of your time. We'll, we'll move as quickly as I can. I know especially y'all's time is uh, super valuable. Uh, but basically what I wanted to do was part one is talk about y'all's new vaccine, Corbivax, um, that you both developed and the impact it will have. And then part two, I actually did something special over the weekend. I had a panel of people that I interviewed that have not been vaccinated. I spoke with them openly. I have been vaccinated. I'm boosted. I'm um, everything you can have up to this point uh, that's been recommended to me. Uh, and I support it all and, and we're all about it. Uh, but I wanted to reach out because I have friends that have not been vaccinated and still have questions and concerns. And I've had countless conversations with them. And I thought, well, OK, I'm going to do it under this guise. OK, let me let me talk to y'all. Then I'm going to have, a, you know, present some of the things they said to me to y'all and see what y'all say. And then they're going to watch this and then we're going to talk again and maybe see if uh, our listeners in conjunction with them, we can learn some stuff uh, through this. So I really appreciate y'all's time. Um, okay, well, the first question all I have is, what is Corbivex and how is it different from an mRNA vaccine? So Peter, and, and maybe just as an FYI, can you make sure you direct who that question goes to? Because sometimes we're like, okay, who goes, who's going to jump sure, first? Sure, absolutely. <laughs> uh, of course. Well, I, I tell you what, Dr. Lena, if you don't mind uh, answering that so first maybe one for I, us. Maybe I can start. So, 
So Corbevax is a protein-based vaccine that we, of course, developed at our Texas Children's Hospital Center for Vaccine Development in conjunction with Biological E. So Corbevax is actually the trademark name that Biological E um, gave to their vaccine produced in India. Um, being a protein-based vaccine, it means that we in the laboratory use a very, very interesting system, which is the yeast system, as our producer. It's pretty much like brewing beer, but instead of brewing beer, we're brewing proteins. And these proteins, which mimic a protein of the virus, in this case, a little subunit of the spike, is the one that eventually is going to trigger the immune response uh, and activate and neutralize the COVID-19 virus. And compared to the RNA or adenoviruses is that we actually immunize with the protein directly rather than codes of either DNA or RNA that needs to still be processed within our bodies to produce the protein. Because ultimately the proteins are the ones who are the, one, that, the ones that activate the immune response. And, and I would say, you know, the advantage of this is it's uh, the process that we use is through yeast fermentation. It's a vegan process, so no human cells or animal cells, and people find that attractive. But also yeah. it's a process that's well vetted and tested. So it's the same process used to make recombinant hepatitis B vaccine that all of us got as kids. And, and so parents and people are familiar with the technology. And more importantly, it's a process that because it's been around for a while, it's in place for producing vaccines locally in Brazil and Argentina and India and Bangladesh and Vietnam and, and, and the list goes on. And so if you want to make a vaccine for global health that could be made at the scale needed, billions of doses, it could be made locally. Uh, this, this is the one that checks all the boxes and it's got the safety profile that people have known about for decades. So people you know, feel comfortable with it. Simple refrigeration, as I say, no, no limit to what you can make. It's the least expensive. Uh, the Indian government has just priced this at 145 rupees and you're probably saying, okay, what's well, 145 rupees? That's a, <laughs> it's a dollar 90, a dollar 90 a dose. That's going to be the least oh, wow. expensive of all the COVID vaccines. So this is pretty exciting because everyone's talking about vaccine equity and, and you know, the multinationals are producing these high technology vaccines that are very expensive and the hope that a few crumbs filter down to the low and middle income countries and say, we don't have to live that way. We, we can empower the vaccine producers locally to make this. So we, as Mary Elena says, we've transferred no patents, no strings attached and we pro let them own the vaccine that they scale up and produce. So we help in the production, but ultimately it's it's what's called decolonization, letting the vaccine producers themselves own it. So India, Indian company biologically owns Corbivax. The Indonesian company Biopharma will own their vaccine. They're actually, because it's vegan, they're going to make a halal version for Muslim majority countries. and. Oh, wow. and, and and the list goes on. So this is why we're so excited. And, and you know, this oh. concept of decolonizing or you know making them indigenous, you know, it's 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 like their homegrown uh, vaccine, which is very different. I mean, even though these are very um, well-known vaccine producers, and they clearly have a, 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 you know many of them, including Biological E vaccine portfolios that, you know, have been providing, in fact, vaccines mostly to, you know, a lot of, you know, our Latin American and other countries already. But usually they're, they're not technologies that they themselves develop from the scratch. They're always either uh, vaccines that have been developed by big multinationals that then go off patent and therefore then they can be reproduced or, you know, uh, you know, called upon as you know their own but they're really coming from somebody else having designed the process this these vaccines that we developed with peter in the vaccine center would enable them to call them really homegrown indigenous because they really get the starter kit but then they have to go through the entire process to develop and rather than receiving something that it's really already you know created by somebody else so i think it's very unique and they've been very eager. In fact, Biological E is very proud that they have this indigenous vaccine. As you know, they're collaborating with many others 
including Johnson and Johnson. But for them, you know, it's 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 a very different feeling to also say that Corbevax is biological ease vaccine that was co-developed with us, but ultimately is their own homegrown. It's empowering, right, for them. Sure, absolutely, without a doubt. So, so the process is a country gets a, you mentioned a starter kit. I'm sure that's a term you were, I don't know, throwing around jokingly or whatever, but is that what it is? They receive some sort of a box that they then pretty much just, there's ingredients in it and they, and they just start yeah, from there. I mean, that's pretty it. Much. Yeah. We send them a box. In fact, UPS, it is a like, it, well, like a UPS. We, <laughs> we actually use a, 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 you know, very special, uh, uh, shipping Okay. Containers and yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, it's not, it's not quite a chia pet. There's a little yeah. more involved. Than, than that. Yeah. Or when you get like, you know, the blue apron, cook it, you cook it, cook it. Yeah. Yeah. Coffee. Yeah. But no, but indeed that's what it is. Right? I, I shouldn't have had that second cup of coffee. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, so, so they have two options, right? So they read our publications that already has the recipes to build the build the, the, the building blocks Yeah. or in fact, they can call us and, you know, that's where we have these non-exclusive agreements with the different producers where we say, yes, we will send you a box that contains, you know, again, the starter kit with, you know, the yeast that already contains the, 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 the you know, the vector that can produce this very recombinant protein. Sure. Plus, you know, all the reagents for you to ensure that you can, you know, evaluate the yields, the purity, you know, and then besides the box of the uh, reagents and the starter kits, we also send them a drop box <laughs> full of files uh, with, of course, uh, all the real nitty gritty, you know, uh, recipes yeah. and reports. And then we also uh, ship them. And you get to, us, and, you, and, then and they meaning, get us. meaning so, that we're on the phone, our scientists are on the phone with their scientists coordinating a times a and, week. Yeah helping and we're exchanging reagents so we're helping them uh, evaluate things so it's very much a co-development so it's a FedEx process. box a drop box and a zoom link yeah and, and a zoom link <laughs> We're changing and the world. Three, we're changing the world. Exactly. Uh, that's amazing. Wow, and and 24 seven, right? Because yeah. know, they can call upon us anytime. And then occasionally we, we can get them with a Which WhatsApp. is why we haven't slept in two years because you know, what oh those calls God. with Asia are like, right? So it's, I can't even you know, imagine. 7am and then it's, you know, 8pm at night. So yeah. It's your sleep days. schedule must be uh, absolutely just. And in my case, sure. I'm either on a call with, Asia or talking to Don Lemon and Mary Elaine is talking to <laughs> Spanish language stations all over the Western hemisphere. And look at that. And uh, so it's, it's a busy, I mean, it's very fulfilling sure. and meaningful and, and that means a lot to both of us, but it's, it's also exhausting. I'm sure it is. I promise oh, you okay. history will look kindly back on y'all. I promise like, Y'all are y'all don't even know. Well, not me. based and on I, what I, Fox I, News said about I, I, me yesterday, last well, week. You know, uh, so Fox News, uh, you know, they, they yeah. went after me two two successive nights last week. Yeah, I saw some stuff uh, of some people going after you. It's just like I, you know, I, honestly, I just ignore it and I just think, okay, I'm I'm not going to focus on that. I'm going to focus on the, you know, what we're what y'all are actually, you know, the changes y'all are making. I. I I appreciate that y'all have to go through all this. And I know that a lot of people support y'all. You have a lot of support you don't even know about. I promise you. It's amazing what y'all are doing. I can't say enough. Like There's not enough words for me to be thankful for what y'all are doing. One, my family comes from Mexico. I know that they've struggled a lot with sort of this and misinformation and trying to get vaccine. And this isn't nothing new in my family down there. So this idea that the forgotten people in my opinion y'all are taken care of like means everything to me and, and to a lot of people so you know to get that out of the way thank y'all uh it, which leads me to my next question actually um recently you know you're not alone here texas congresswoman Liz, lizzie fletcher nominated you both for the nobel peace prize i want to read a part of her statement because i think it's important uh, dr hotez and dr batazzi's effort to develop the Cor corbivax vaccine is truly one of the international cooperation and partnership to bring health, security, and peace around the world by creating a COVID-19 vaccine and making it available and accessible to all. It is a contribution that is one of the greatest benefit to humankind. 
Um, one, two parts to that question. Do you wish it was like a Nobel Prize for like in science? Does that even matter to y'all? And two, what are the reasons Corbivax is going to make the difference combating globally? I know y'all mentioned some of the other ones, but what are some of the main reasons that rise to the top, just in layman terms for a lot of our listeners? Well, uh, maybe, Botazi, okay. sorry, I, I apologize. <laughs> oh my gosh, okay. I'm so sorry. That's okay. Yes. Uh, usually, I, I I look at Peter see if he's going <laughs> for it or not. But yeah. okay. So first of all, I have to say, for me, in personally, and vice versa, and vice versa right? <laughs> but for me personally, I mean, I've been working alongside Peter for 20 years, and you know, besides the fact that we are again dynamic duos, but Peter has <laughs> been, you know, one of my biggest mentors and champions, you know, and, and to share this nomination with him is probably, you know, the dream that probably I never really had dreamed or dreamt, sorry, <laughs> my, my English sometimes, you know, goes astray. Um, but it's just, you know, uh, unbelievable because from the moment I met him, we've, we, we've seen this vision that diplomacy, it, it it, it really would make a difference in everything that we did. So it's not only, again, advancing science and, and sometimes, honestly, transversing or, or, or jumping through scientific hurdles. It's easy for us because we're scientists, right? We yeah. know how to you know, jump over science issues, but we know the hardships when you have to really jump some of the policy or some of the you know, social interactions or even the cultural, you know, um, you know, differences and, and how do you really shape that conversation to, to make things in a way that then they can really reach the people who need them is probably the hardest things that we have to do daily, right? And so knowing that this nomination was indeed for that, for the years that we've been trying to learn how to do this vaccine diplomacy, I think it it's just something that, you know, it's, it's been just amazing for us. And for me personally, it's great. Just with that nomination, I think we, we, we have won a, a lot of respect and we are so great, grateful to our Congressman, Congresswoman Lizzie Fletcher. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I'll say the science is interesting. And they, there are interesting scientific problems that we solve. But equally important or more important, we're trying to do this in a way that builds capacity across the world. Because making vaccines is not the same as small molecule drugs or diagnostics. You know, with small molecule drugs, if you have the patent, the recipe, then that opens the door, right? And you can usually hire chemists to make it. Um, with vaccines, it's quite different. And that's where a lot of people don't quite understand you know, it's not just the recipe, it's just building the human capital and the training to know how to make vaccines under a quality umbrella and at scale under quality control, quality assurance. And this is what we provide. And this is, you know, especially the brilliance of Mary Elena, knowing how to do this with rigor and with the right kind of documentation and the best production documentation and the quality control, quality assurance and the oversight of working with national regulators, that's the hard part of making vaccines. And that's why you have so few countries that make vaccines right now. It's because of that, that challenge and, and yeah. people often don't understand this. So we're very much committed to that capacity building. Was that what I like to say is if you know, you're a Nigerian scientist or a Bangladeshi scientist, you can't walk into GlaxoSmithKline or Merck or Pfizer or Moderna and say, show me how to make a vaccine, but you can with us. And we do wow. that. And, uh, and that's, that's really, uh, and cause we recognize that, you know, the vaccines that we make for some of them, maybe they'll be refined or improved, but, uh, but this is a gift to the world by, you know, teaching people how to make vaccines and build that capacity. And that's why the vaccine ecosystem needs to change because it's still too, focused on the multinational companies. There's still this thing out there that basically said, people don't ex explicitly say it like this, but that's what they mean. They say only the multinational companies can pull this off. We're gonna incentivize them financially to do that. And maybe in time vaccines will filter down. And we're saying, no, um, we think, you know, there's this group of organizations that actually 
uh, bands together in a network. They call themselves the Developing Country Vaccine Manufacturers Network, DCVMN.org. And we wow. work with them to build that capacity and that partnership. So it's very special. And I think, you know, we've been doing this for our parasitic disease vaccines, which sort of flew below the radar screen because people don't care as much about schistosomiasis and Chagas disease because they're diseases of the those. poor. But doing it for COVID, that's been the game changer in terms of, you know, grabbing people's attention. Yeah. And I, and I want to highlight another huge point, which also I think people don't realize is the amazing role that academic and, and certainly in, in health systems, you know, like hospital systems have, right? Because as you see in the Texas Medical Center, which is this, this marriage between, of course, the universities, right? Or, or, you know, Baylor College of Medicine and many others with their affiliated hospitals, which of course then translate, you know, the discoveries from the research, you know, into clinical care, right? And, and take care of our communities is very important. And how now we do play this role where all the curiosity really comes from our research uh, endeavors. And there's always this notion that things that come out of academia um, is not uh, ready enough to translate into real uh, interventions or solutions and that the big multinationals come and scoop away your intellectual property but then they take it into a big black hole, they redo it, and eventually they have a drug or they have you know, a, you know, a diagnostic. Now, more and more, they actually call upon us to do the hard work and de-risk a lot of the risk right? that you know, entertains this development. And now more and more, our institutions really know how to do this. Like we are a small mini biotech you know, company Nonprofit embed, embedded within the you know university system with Texas Children's and Baylor. Peter calls us the money losing guaranteed you know biotechnology <laughs> company, but that's okay, right? You know, but again, because when we then give these starter kits, they are regulatory enabling starter kits. They're not starter kits that then they say, oh my God, what are all these things? We don't. We yeah. have to restart all over. And that's I think something that you know we are. Um, trying to also change the paradigm that you know universities and academia sure. has a very important role now into advancing these types of solutions and and that has to occur not only in the U.S. and high income countries it has also to occur in you know all the countries especially the global south. It's giving them the fish and and teaching them to fish at the right. same time. Exactly. Well, this was this was also you know one of the side stories of all this is the fact that we came to Texas to do that because yeah. we came, you know, Mary Lane and I came from Ivy League institutions in the Northeast and Penn and Cornell and Rockefeller and Yale and Harvard. And people say, well, why'd you come to Texas? Well, if we hadn't come to Texas, this wouldn't have happened because we needed the horsepower of, a, of the institutions of the Texas Medical Center, Texas Children's Hospital, Baylor College of Medicine, and not only that, the Houston community is a very, in Texas, a very philanthropic community. So we were basically cut out of Operation Warp Speed um, early on and a lot of the G7 public funding. So rather than just shrivel up and go away, we said, hell no. I mean, as we say in Texas. And, and what we did was we raised the money privately, right? We got um, fund, I got a, um, a over a million dollars from Tito's Vodka. So. So if you get your, if you, I know you're not supposed to endorse alcohol, but if you, if you happen to have a vodka, this is a different kind tonight, of podcast. Make sure We're called the Lone Tito's Star Plate. Up. I'm a chef, right? We talk food. So the Tito's yeah. thing's okay. We can endorse yeah. that. Okay. So, so, <laughs> and then unique, the Clayberg, uh, then the, yeah. <laughs> the Clayberg Foundation, which wow. is based in San Antonio, the, the, um, the Dunn Foundation and the Anderson Foundation, um, and wow. also some New York foundations, little, but you know, it was Texas philanthropy that came through for, so if we hadn't come to Texas, I can promise you there'd been no COVID yeah, vaccine. Absolutely. And that's a side of Texas people don't hear about, right? right? You sure. Know, and I go on the cable news networks all the time and you know how they want to portray us. It's all the, all the, all the wackadoos, right? So those are the ones they talk about, but not the fact that this is a state of innovation and a state of, um, of science. We have our, we have our own Academy of Sciences here. Texas is called TAMAS, the Academy of Medicine, Engineering, and Science oh, wow. of Texas, where all the members of the National Academies are, are, are part of this. So, 
So it's a very special state that, that we're in that, that we, we could do this. So today I heard awesome. from our Texas Children's and you know, philanthropists in general from you know, more than 1,500 individuals, institutions, organizations, foundations came to the rescue to us during this last wow. uh, 20 months or, or, or plus. Wow. So it was amazing, right? Amazing. Wow. That's like real, real work, real, you know, people making a real difference. If we were baseball managers, there'd be a lot of bunting and base stealing. And, uh, <laughs> and the... this is like money ball vaccine. This is like, right, yeah, right. small ball, small ball. Yeah, small ball. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, that's funny. That's funny. Um, okay. Yeah. I had a question about um, just mRNA technology. In fact, in reference to y'all's vaccine, um, I'm curious if mRNA vaccines any way affected y'all's vaccine, the way that's developed. Did it update? Did it change? I know they're different, but does that happen? Did you learn something from that? Or can you apply it to how you do it in some way along the timeline? I don't know that if it works that way. Oh, well, mRNA has been around actually for, for a while. We actually have an mRNA program in our lab or our group, not for COVID, but for Chagas disease. And it's an interesting technology. It, you know, as I like to say, every vaccine technology has advantages and disadvantages. And, sure. and no vaccine is a, is a miracle of vaccine. In the case of mRNA, uh, the, the advantage of it is you can move pretty quickly because you can make a piece of mRNA fast. Um, the problem with it is keeping it stabilized. And that was the innovation and that Moderna and Pfizer came up with was one, figuring out how to stabilize it because it's a very labile molecule that can fall apart because of enzymes called ribonucleases. And also substituting some of the uh, nucleotides to give ones that don't trigger the innate immune system to make it too toxic. So it's an interesting system. To, and so the advantage is you can move very quickly you know, I got uh, my Pfizer BioNTech vaccine, and and I'm grateful for it. I, you know, it could have very well have saved my life. But the disadvantage is, like any brand new technology, there's a learning curve before you go from zero to the nine billion doses you need for the world's low and middle income yeah, countries, and Jesus. and eventually they'll figure out how to do it. But not, in, I'm not convinced it'll do it in time for this pandemic. Whereas ours, even though it takes a little longer to make the protein just by a few months, you make up for lost time. The fact that you can already slot it into all that manufacturing horsepower they have all over the world's low and middle income countries. And that was the I problem see. with the big, with the, the, with the policymakers. It was a science policy failure, not thinking adequately that if they only rely on the new technologies or what I sometimes call the shiny new toys, you're going to miss the opportunity to rapidly vaccinate the world's low and middle income country because you can't sure. make the stuff at, at scale. So there needed to be more of a balance. Yeah. And, and, that, and that was the mistake. Yeah, that seems like it would have been using all of it, you know, y'all's vaccine, this vaccine, right? Like, would that you think that would have scared people that there would have been these different options? You think that would have maybe been I, a reason? I don't know. To... And, you know, to this day, Mary Elena and I each get, you know, a dozen emails a day saying, hey, doc, uh, you know, I'm not taking that mRNA vaccine, and I try to argue with them why they should. But the, you know, eventually, some people are really dug in. They say, "But I'll take your vaccine if you make it available, because I already gave that to my kids and uh, that same technology, and I saw that it's safe." And you no, know, and I say, "Yeah, I know, but we couldn't persuade the U.S. government to roll the dice with us and give us support or find a manufacturing partner." So, oh. so oh. you know. But, but go take, that's not a reason not to take the mRNA vaccine. Agreed, agreed. Uh, yeah, I don't know anything about vaccines, and I, I got it right away, uh, for sure. Um, Dr. Elena, um, y'all said y'all worked on mRNA vaccines. It, the technology y'all use for the Corbivax, is that something that will eventually go away? Like y'all won't be able to use that anymore, and it'll no. all go to mRNA? No, I don't think so, because I think as Peter very clearly stated, you know, each, of course, each disease that they we have will ever get hit, you know, it will cause by, you know, multiple different pathogens doesn't imply that a technology that you use to uh, produce a vaccine is going to work for the next pathogen. 
right? Got it. Okay. So similar to how we are always enticed to make sure you have a very diversified, you know, financial portfolio. You hear, right? You know, you know, make sure you put your money sure. in all these investments to make sure because you don't know how the stock goes and if you put it in bonds or whatever. It's the same way with vaccines, right? You don't want to put all your eggs, you know, in one basket, right? That makes because sense. Makes sense. So today we were very lucky indeed that the RNA technology pro work was proven to function positively to you know prevent you know uh, COVID nineteen. Not enough to, of course, be able to support the production and delivery for nine billion people around the world. But you know clearly it's a precedent. And as Peter said, we are also very interested in that technology ourselves, and we're going to try it you know for many other of our portfolio. But at the same time, if you were to be a producer, a vaccine producer, I would want to have a diversified, you know, a capability, right? You know, of sure. inactivated vaccines when applicable or recombinant proteins, some of them microbial uh, fermentation using yeast. Maybe you can also do some bacteria or other, you know, systems. And of course, having RNA or having these viral vectors. So I think that you, you know, if they are intelligent, they should diversify their portfolio because they can then be very flexible at shifting depending on what platform actually works for against which pathogen or against each disease. So I think it's just no brainer. And I think that was a big failure, as Peter said, what, that when you look around the table at the beginning of the pandemic, they were all either RNA or DNA or adenoviruses, which they are great techniques and technologies, but none of them was proven to have even worked before. None of them were licensed before. And, and then the other side of the coin were the whole inactivated virus vaccines, of course, led by countries like China, but nowhere to be found were the very basic conventional protein-based vaccines, which was very interesting, to be quite honest. That is interesting. That's so odd. When I read y'all's story, I didn't hear about any of this. And I thought, wait a second, why didn't we hear about this at the beginning of the pandemic? Why, why didn't the American people get a chance to say, hey, wait a second, we, we'd like to look into this over here. Like, it kind of angers me, to be honest. I mean, not to go down that rabbit hole, but it kind of angered me a little bit, like, Man, that, that's not helping this whole misinformation cause and trusting what the government was telling us as people of what to do. And, you know, it just doesn't help that argument, I think, in my opinion. I don't know. Anyway. Well, uh, you know, the problem with Operation Warp Speed, you know, was an interesting by design. I think the part of the problem was there was no control over the company press releases. Yeah, and there was point. no communication strategy for Operation Warp Speed. They just let the companies control it. And, you know, when a CEO of a company writes a press release, he's not writing it for you or for me. He's writing it for his shareholders. And, and of course, he's going to spectacularize his accomplishment and, and, and doesn't back it up with this or that. And so this causes a lot of chaos and confusion. And that, that didn't help. Yeah, you're right. I can't disagree with that. Um, all right, I move on to the second part just to end out here. Just we'll round it out. We'll, we'll go quick. Uh, I, you know, I know these some of these questions might require a longer answer, but if it's possible just to kind of give, you know what I mean, just so we can fire through these. And then uh, uh, I have a question, Mary Lane, and I have a qu couple of questions for you after. Sure. Oh, absolutely. Of course. To, to make it interesting. Yeah, <laughs> I like it. <laughs> I like it. Um, okay, what, um, Dr. Lane, I'll, I'll ask you first, what, what is misinformation mean to you, that word? Oh, misinformation to me means when someone takes bits and pieces of truth and converts them into false statements. Okay, okay, I like that. Yeah, I haven't heard it put that way before, actually. And, and and to add on to that, yeah, yeah, there's, please. There's misinformation and there's disinformation. Disinformation okay. is misinformation with intent, meaning I mean anybody could say make a mistake or say something that's wrong, uh, but in good faith, as opposed to disinformation, okay. which is what you have now. You have what my friend Imran Ahmed calls the the disinformation dozen, a dozen non-governmental organizations 
that are responsible for 65% of the disinformation and um, and they're organized and funded to actually spread disinformation or yes. or the Putin propaganda machine, which has also now become a source of disinformation using as a wedge issue to divide our country. Oh, horrible. Well, thank you for that distinction. No, that's very good. No, I appreciate that. Um, OK, well, Dr. Lane, I'll go back to you again. Um, why is there a booster shot? Why do we need a booster shot if the vaccine is supposed to protect us from COVID? Well, in fact, if you look uh, just historically, how do vaccines work? And you look at all the pediatric vaccines that already exist, maybe, of course, except of the influenza vaccine, which, of course, you have to do it every year because of a different reason. All vaccines require multiple shots. And why is that, right? You First, what, you, know, you show something to your system, it responds, but then you need to recall it and you know, come up and build that memory. And usually you do things at the beginning very quick after the other, but then you let some time go on and kind of like you know, recall it again. So if you look, to be honest, most likely the intent really was always that these vaccines would need to be either three or even four doses, because that's how vaccines we know that it, that work and that build, you know, upon you know your system to be able to maintain that duration and eventually memory, right? Because we never know when we're going to get hit by these pathogens. Of course, it's very difficult to explain it in the midst of having the pandemic, because of course you have the pathogen. But in theory, you want to do these strategies also to ensure that. In, in the long term, you are indeed protected, right? That you don't have to um, avoid, you know, losing that protection if you just get one dose of the vaccine. Wow. Um, Dr. Hotez, a big argument made by people who haven't gotten the vaccine is it doesn't protect you because you still get it. So why can you still get COVID if you are vaccinated? Muted. Oh, you're muted, uh, Dr. Hotez. So the vaccines were designed to halt symptomatic illness. And ultimately, it turned out for the Alpha and Delta variant, they were also stopping asymptomatic infection as well. With Omicron, they're still doing a good job stopping symptomatic illness, especially if you get the booster, um, but not as strong as stopping infection. So here are the numbers. If you get, um, if you get, uh, vaccinated, the two doses and boosted, the CDC has come out with the data now showing a 90% reduction in getting hospitalized, 82% reduction of getting an emergency room visit. But, you know, now there's this sort of buzz out there saying, hey, wait a minute, it's not stopping infection. It's not true. It is. So the CDC has come out now with data was published in the Morbidity Mortality Weekly Reports, MNWR, which is their major platform for disseminating information, showing that if you get um, vaccinated and boosted, you're 3.6 times less likely also to get infected uh, as well. So there is an effect on reducing getting the infection. And there's also a reduction in the amount of time you're gonna shed virus. So, and, and because of that, it could also have a big impact uh. on preventing long COVID. So, you know, again, this is an example of disinformation. They, you know, they use this as, an ex as a way to try to discredit vaccines. The vaccines are still good. Sure, I, I um, couldn't agree more. Um, okay, um, Dr. Elena, why should I, this is not obviously not me, right? I'm, I'm saying this as, as I in general here. Why should I get the vaccine if I'm not immunocompromised, older, or at risk? You know, I'm healthy. I'm yeah. Why? Why do I need even need to get this? Well, first of all, because indeed you still protect yourselves. Even if you think you're healthy, you, you know, certainly I would prefer to be protected myself. But also in because you probably are living, you know, where you will become in contact with those that are less fortunate of you know having, you know, some risk factor that puts them in more you know at higher risk. Or, or elderly, you, for example, you know, living with your parents or your relatives, um, and even just colleagues at work. Um, so I think that it is, again, vaccines 
in this case, you know, are a tool that not only protects you individually, but it does have a direct impact on the community. And, you know, and I think that's the reason why it's, you know, a very important public health tool that we need to, to all use, especially when they work, right? Um, so I think that's, yes. uh, that's key. I agree. I appreciate all these answers, y'all. I'm really hoping this uh, does some stuff for people. Um, Dr. Hotez, um, if why should people who are vaccinated be scared of people who are not vaccinated? That's something that non-vaccinated people will say, well, what are you worried about? You're vaccinated. Why should you be worried about me? Well, the, the reason is because even though the vaccines are doing a great job of keeping you out of the hospital and keeping you out of the emergency room, no vaccine is perfect, right? So there's, you know, even though there's a 90% reduction, it's not a 100% reduction for hospitalization or an 82% reduction for emergency room visit. Even though you're four times less likely to get infected, you could still get infected and and therefore potentially develop long COVID. I mean, you know, the, what are the reasons I got vaccinated? Well, one, of course, I don't want to die. I don't want to go to the hospital, but I also don't want to get COVID. I don't want to get you know, gray matter brain degeneration and cognitive declines and have a brain scan that looks like somebody 20 years older than I am. And so I want you to get vaccinated and stop, you know, and, and if enough people get vaccinated, we could slow transmission. And, and, and if you have little kids around or too young to get vaccinated, they're getting infected and going into the hospital. So, so for all those reasons, people who don't get vaccinated are endangering the public. Um, Dr. Lena, one conspiracy that I've heard is that hospitals put COVID as the cause of death when in reality they might have died of something else, essentially boosting these COVID death numbers. What are your thoughts on hearing that or to somebody saying that, you know, using that as data, you know, they, they died of this, but, you know, heart attack, but they had COVID, so they put COVID. How do I, how do we dispel that myth for people? Well, it's a, it's a very interesting, you know, myth that you actually bring up because, of course, when you um, are infected by these types of viruses and knowing that this virus is, it was a very complex virus that not only is a respiratory virus, but had the ability of really disrupting so many other organs and systems, right? You know, circulation system, your cardiac system. Um, and, and, and it may be, you know, deceiving that you think that, you know, you basically eventually have symptoms that are not fully related to respiratory. So I think that you just have to recognize that, you know, these viruses are very complex. And I think that the hospitals do their best in ensuring that you get the best, you know, clinical care. And, and, and it, it doesn't really matter eventually, you know, what the cause of death is, right? I mean, I think what it matters is that, you know, it, it may have been exacerbated by the fact that you were exposed to the virus, by the fact that you, you know, the individual may have had underlying other risks that then, you know, it could have led to having another infection, right? Or could have led to exacerbate a, a cardiac, you know, problem they already have. But ultimately, I have to say that if you were infected, the likelihood is that, you know, there is a reason that it comes back to the fact that it was related to, to the infection by the virus. So I think that's what we're trying to learn even more and more about the long-term sequelae of having been, you know, infected by this virus, because eventually you could really, you know, change the way that your um, clinical uh, or risk of, of, of different diseases are, you know, because of this. Yeah, absolutely. It's a difficult uh, question. I'm not sure how no, I know. comfortable I, I, I am with that because I'm not a physician, FYI. So, sure, sure. You know, maybe I, something not holding that, you to any of this, yeah. uh, of course. <laughs> These are your, your thoughts and, uh, you know, opinions in some of this for sure. Um, you know, people, uh, Dr. Hotez, people will say, um, you know, masks, do they work? They don't work. What... Do, what what I, I don't even know what to say to people, to be honest with you. I've heard it go back and forth, although I just have worn it the whole time. I, I didn't listen to anything. I, what, do we should we still be wearing masks um, if we're vaccinated? Like what what do we do there? 
Yeah, well, you should definitely do it while there's a lot of virus transmission going on. The good news is now it's starting to go down, and if it continues along the same trajectory, and if we don't get the BA2 variant coming in, then I think potentially masks can come off in schools and elsewhere. I wouldn't do it just yet. There's still a pretty high level of transmission, but it's coming down quickly. So the big question is whether it comes all the way down to the bottom or whether it gets, like in England, it gets stuck two-thirds of the way down and then lingers for a while. So we'll know that soon. But okay. once that happens, then I think we can, you know, go back with, to not wearing masks, at least for a while, until the next variant comes in from a low and middle income country because we failed to vaccinate the world. Um, but but at least for a while, we can do that. In terms of masks, no question, they have a big impact on reducing transmission. But with Omicron, which is so transmissible, it needs to be the right kind of mask. And so what I'll do, um, and when I come into, so I'm sitting in my office here, closing close the door, but when I'm walking in the hallways at work, I have, um, you know, uh, this is a, a KN95 mask. And then I'll put over it a uh, just a surgical mask for an extra layer of protection. The cloth masks aren't cutting it, unfortunately. So my my bandana that I wear is not doing anything. No, no. Well, maybe doing a little bit, but not much. I mean, but not what I could be doing. Right. right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Fair enough. I you know glad you said that. Um, I'm sure, a lot of people still we we still you know as crazy as you would think as much information is supposedly at our disposal. I still don't know something as simple as that. And um, okay, um, the la last question here, Doctor uh, Elena. Um, make sure this is a good one here. I have a few, but I just want to make sure this is a good one. Um, okay, this is something I think is very um, important, in my opinion. I'm curious how actually both of y'all feel about this, uh, but we'll start with you, Doctor Elena. I, I feel that. Um, a new virus arose during this pandemic in a way, and I call it the FU virus. And it's like basically people who are vaccinated are shaming the unvaccinated. And I have a lot of friends that are unvaccinated and I feel like it's the wrong approach to call them idiots and, you're the, and you deserve to die and we're not, you know, you don't deserve a hospital bed. And I hear this on the news as well from newscasters I feel it's almost just as dangerous as disinformation or misinformation, because if the goal is to get people vaccinated, then, you know, you, you catch a fly with honey, not vinegar, right? Like the, the idea would be to be more encouraging, educate them, answer their questions, listen to their concern. I personally have found living here in Texas and being vaccinated and pushing for that. I, found, I do have a lot of friends that are not vaccinated, don't want to get it. And I've never pushed them away. I've just sort of tried to listen and I try to understand where they're coming from, maybe try to answer some of their, their questions. In fact, I'm doing it with this um, as well. And my friends are ones in Washington that I asked, ones in Missouri, ones in Texas. So I tried to get a good you know, viewpoint of the world. But I'm curious what y'all think about that approach of trying to reach people. You know, I don't know, Dr. Lane, I'll, I'll just pass to you. I don't want to ramble anymore. Here. Well, I have to say, I agree with you. And if one thing that I have learned from Peter and that he has taught me throughout the years is you always have to be good with your friends as well as with your potentially your enemies, right? So always be good to everyone because as you said, right? You know, everybody has their own maybe reasons, you know, maybe they may be misinformed reasons, sure. but, but sure. you know, everybody has their story, right? Of why, you know, they believe something or they think they believe something. So I agree with you. I think that, you know, first of all, we have to be very good listeners because the same way how, you know, we can provide our own stories of why we are believers of vaccines and even more because we are scientists actually really literally seeing the benefits that they can, you know, provide to, you know, human beings. But at the same time, you know, be able to, you know, uh, listen to everybody else's uh, stories and maybe then based on that, you know, you really can make, you know, an, a, a, a conversation and really shifting that conversation. It shouldn't be a debate. It shouldn't be, you know, the fact that, you know, you have to convince them is, is really understanding why and maybe then just giving your own side of the story, right? Say, you know, I, I understand why you're coming from, but, you know, this is why, you know, I believe, you know, on yeah. uh, the vaccines. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I agree. Dr. Hotez, what do you think? Yeah, no, it's it's tough because, you know, what's happened now is vaccine refusal is, as pointed out by Charles Gabba, the New York Times, the Kaiser Family Foundation, NPR, clearly is very much along a partisan divide and is particularly virulent here in Texas. And so people now are tying their political identity to not getting vaccinated. Yes. And the consequences yes. are terrible. Yeah. We've yeah. Since the summer, we've lost 25,000 unvaccinated Texans to oh. COVID. They basically have thrown their lives away. For what? For nothing. And, um, and so trying to uncouple the anti-science from the politics has been one of the toughest things I've ever had to do. I can't imagine that fight. I can't, I can't imagine um, the frustration y'all must have. I, I, you know, I, I, I always compare it with my friends, like running a restaurant, right? We, I, I come from that, that field and I hear people talking about the food industry or servers. And I'm like, you don't have any idea what you're talking about. You know, you, it's like, I, I'm sure that, that y'all have to feel the same way. I honestly tried to make that connection with my friends who don't want to get vaccinated. Look, you're in the trucking industry, right? Uh, my friend Eric. Right. You, you, and you hear people talking about the trucking industry on the news or something. You're always like, they don't know what they're talking about. How do you think these scientists feel when they hear you saying you did your research yeah, and you're talking about this? Right. Well, how do you think they feel? I, I would imagine it's the same, right? The same sort of frustration. It's very of, tough. It's very yeah, tough. I, I can't. And lives are at stake. Right. That's the dif difference of you know, you're misinformed on how to cook this macaroni and cheese. OK, I can get upset about that, but <laughs> what y'all are talking about is life and death. So that different, that misinformation is, is deadly, you know? All right. All right. Yeah. Last question for you yes. now is sure. uh, given your expertise on the restaurants of Texas, uh, what's your top favorites in here in Houston? Oh, Houston. Okay. Yes. I was going to ask y'all the same thing. I uh, want to know, I want y'all to give some shout outs afterwards of y'all's places too in Houston. Uh, but I would say um, right now, I want to give a shout out to Truth Barbecue in Houston. Uh, they made the top 10 in um, Texas Monthly's top 50 barbecue spots. It only gets put out every four years. And that is actually, might as well be the top barbecue in the world, right? If you're from Texas, that's oh, the wow. world. Okay, that's the world. So Truth Barbecue in Houston, check it out. It's amazing. We actually interviewed Leonardo Botello IV, who's the pit master there. Uh, for those listening, you can check out that interview. Uh, in our catalog as well. But yeah, Truth Barbecue in Houston, without a doubt. Well, I live a few blocks away from Ugo's restaurant, from Ugo Ortega's restaurant. So oh, uh, wow. that's always our go that's always oh. our go to place. Oh my that's your go to? That's a good go to. That's a good go to for sure. What other sort of shout outs? Y'all have any food trucks or I come from the food truck uh, game as well. So yeah. any food we have trucks? A big want to collection shout out? Of we live in my live in Mon We both live pretty yeah. close to each other, live in Montrose. So we got all the food trucks there. And then um, and then my special needs daughter likes to go to Cafe Brazil, which is a very casual place. Love outside. Cafe Brazil. Yeah. yeah. These days, I'm mostly going to outdoor seating places whenever possible. So fair enough, so that's absolutely. A, that's a good one. <laughs> yeah, I think well, Mary Lane is the true expert. So. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, okay. Yeah, okay. I, I'm. I'm. Uh, I don't think I have. I can pinpoint one specific that I is my favorite, but I think that another thing that I love about Texas and certainly Houston, especially, is that I don't think anybody really understands how is a hidden jewel for culinary experience. A hundred percent. I mean, you can I get think any it, kind of food you want in Houston. It's you the most can get any kind of food. Exactly. And, yeah. uh, you know, from, of course, very sophisticated. I would say in the whole you know, country, it's one of the most diverse food cities in the whole country. Yes. In my opinion. And, uh, you know, you name it, you want, you know, certainly, you know, I'm from Honduras. So if you want to eat a very good sopa de caracol and you really are craving Ay, vamos, one in dímelo, Houston, dímelo. Yeah, you yeah. can find that in Houston. Right. So I think that was a, a, a also a very pleasant surprise. I'm a big foodie, so I'm always looking to find where the roots of, uh, of a city are. And I have to say, Houston is a difficult because you can find roots of pretty much the United Nations, right? So yeah. it's, it's, it's amazing. Absolutely. And and with that comes the hidden, not only culinary, uh, um, you know, uh, environment, 
but also the arts and the music. Oh my God, you know, oh, it's yes. like you can find artists and music that are unbelievable. Paired Beyonce's with... from Houston, y'all, okay? Selena Gomez, we could go down the list of the people that are from Houston musically. Yeah, you're, I mean, you're 100% right. So you know what it is, right? Everything is big in Texas. So from science to food to art <laughs> to music, and then of course you have all the oil and energy and NASA uh, on top of that. But <laughs> right, I mean Texas is just that's why we love this great state. Um, and it is not what people think outside of this state. I'm glad y'all have been really, really pointing that out for people. Uh, although most of our listeners are from Texas, um, there's still that stigma of what people think of texas outside of texas you know uh and i'm glad y'all are out here fighting that stigma and fighting that battle uh we're doing great things i'm happy to hear that we're you know part of this whatever y'all doing we like i'm i'm throwing myself in there like i did something uh but you know uh just proud proud of of what y'all are doing and and everything that's going on look is there anything that y'all wanted to quickly mention that i didn't mention anything you wanted to say to our listeners who are listening or anybody that's not vaccinated one last final word to them uh you know we'll wrap this up for y'all well we still have omicron and the ba2 variant may be coming and we're still losing 2500 americans every day to now omicron the only way you can practically guarantee you won't die is if you get vaccinated and it couldn't be simpler. And my message is thank you to Texas because Texas is actually vaccinating the world. Um, wow. Maybe even more than how many other big countries are doing. So we are very privileged to be able to do this and gift the, the COVID-19 vaccines to the world. Thank we call it Texas vaccine diplomacy. I love that. That's awesome. Wow. Well, listen, y'all, again, I, I, there's just not enough words to thank y'all for what you're doing. Um, I'm sure you're going to hear it for a while. I appreciate all the sacrifice y'all are doing. You'll catch up on sleep at some point down the line. Uh, right. Uh, so, uh, well, if there's ever a chance we're ever uh, able to eat down in Houston, we'll make that happen somehow. I definitely know a lot of chefs and places out there. So we'll, well, we'll go. Give or, us or a something. call when you're in town and we'll, we'll come meet you wherever you go. For sure, I'll absolutely. Take, I'll take you for a tequila at the Ugo's. Oh, you had me a tequila. And a, oh, and a yeah. nice uh, a lobster taco, which are <laughs> fantastic. That sounds great. That's wonderful. Uh, well, listen, again, thank you all so very much for your time as well. Um, and yes, congratulations on, uh, you know, on all the attention and just for bringing awareness to all this. And, and thank you so much for just your honesty and transparency on the questions. It's, I really feel it's going to help some of our listeners. Um, you know, Absolutely. Yeah, I really Absolutely. do. I, I really feel that way. So thank you all so much. And uh, please enjoy the rest of your week. Thank you so much. Thank you. You too. All the best. All right. Bye. All, right. all the best. Bye bye. And now it's time for my favorite part of the show the end credits. This is everyone responsible for making the show happen. Executive producer, Sebastian Sauerborn. Podcast manager, Nevena Ponovich. Marketing Manager, Caroline Grape. Video and Audio Editors, Danilo Vojnov and Pavel Sebastianovich. Thumbnail Designer, Marco Vukovic. Social Media Manager, Ursa Rusman. Guest Outreach, Corey Menciez. Designing Image Quotes, Jay Apuya. Social Media Videos, Labri Fernandez. Outreach Support, Yonet Del Mundo. Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you next time. The Lone Star Play podcast is produced by Texas Real Food. Go to texasrealfood.com and you can search your city for stores, butchers, restaurants, farmers markets, and more who are using fresh, artisanal, organic sources. It's a fun site that brings all natural options all together. I hope you enjoyed this episode. For more information, go to thelonestarplay.com. I'm your host, Patrick Scott Armstrong. Until next time.